May Day, May Day. Yes, it's May Day, and we're going to talk with Ron Yarnell about the historic significance of May Day. First, though, we're going to talk with State Senator Mark Shelgren about food banks. I kind of like funding them. He kind of doesn't. We'll have a little debate about that. We're also going to talk about what some are calling Mike Gronstall's betrayal on a critical hog confinement issue. And we've got a little more ground to cover on, N on the NBA's Jason Collins coming out last week. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Ed Fallon here, folks. Gateway Market and Cafe is your locally owned source for specialty groceries. Enjoy chef-crafted, prepared foods, artisan baked goods, organic produce, specialty cheeses, and hand-selected wines and craft beer. Visit the Lively Cafe for breakfast, lunch, or dinner seven days a week. Gateway Market is centrally located on the corner of Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway and Woodland Ave. Stop by or visit www.gatewaymarket.com for more details. That's Gateway Market, folks. Good food, great community. I'm a burrito. I'm a fighting burrito full of fresh ingredients prepared before your very eyes. I don't have eyes. I have over 28 options and 268 million combinations, including Rizzo for vegetarians. I can take my meat off and call myself vegetarian. Put that back on. The fighting burrito is locally owned. I'm owned by some big corporation somewhere. Say, you want to go on a date? No, thanks. I'm seeing a quesadilla. The fighting burrito online fightingburrito.com. Join the fight. This is Dr. Holding of the Story County Veterinary Clinic. For 15 years, we have been spaying and neutering feral cat groups at affordable prices. Wild cats destroy game birds and songbirds. A single female cat can produce over 4,000 kittens in seven years. The shelters are full, so unwanted kittens will be put to sleep. Your cats will stay home and stay healthy. Call us for all your dog and cat needs at the Story County Veterinary Clinic between Ames and Nevada on Highway 30, one mile east of Interstate 35, 515-232-8766. Local farms, global flavor. That's the secret to Hawk's growing popularity. The best meals begin with the best ingredients, and 90% of Hawk's ingredients come from local farms. In addition to seasonal fruits and vegetables, Hawk features grass-fed beef and lamb and pasture-raised chicken and duck, all raised without hormones, steroids, or cages. The coffee is fair trade, locally roasted, and Hawk's house liquors come from right here in Iowa. Hawk's owners go the extra mile, composting organic waste and recycling. For more information or to make reservations, Visit hawktable.com. That's H O Q table.com. With warm weather finally here, it's time to think about upgrading the efficiency of your furnace and air conditioner. Leonard Tinker Heating and Cooling has provided honest, competent service for over 20 years. Whether it's your home or business, for repair work or to install a more energy-efficient furnace or air conditioner, call Leonard Tinker at 263-0422. That's 263-0422. For honest, competent heating and cooling service, call Leonard Tinker at 263-0422. The 8th Annual Natural Living Expo is May 18th and 19th at the 4-H Building at the Iowa State Fairgrounds. The Natural Living Expo is the place to learn about sustainable practices and healthy lifestyle choices. The Expo offers classes and vendors where you'll learn about green building design, sustainable agriculture, urban farming, non-toxic cleaning products, massage, and more. There's no cost to attend, and what you'll come away with is priceless. For more information, visit www.naturallivingexpo.org. That's www.naturallivingexpo.org. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Brother Trucker, folks, and we're kicking off our conversation here today on the Fallon Forum. Gosh, I tell you, I mean, we're in downtown Des Moines yesterday. I was talking about how there was no traffic in the Skywalk because everybody was outside enjoying what had to be a picture-perfect day. And, uh, yeah, today we got quite a bit of traffic in the Skywalk, and I'm waving to everyone right now. Hey, folks. Yeah. Uh, I got a little grimace out of one guy. Anyway, um, yeah, we are broadcasting from the Skywalk here in the cultural and culinary crossroads of America. And I want to thank Webcast One Live for providing that studio. I want to thank the Iowa chapter of the Sierra Club, 
Also, Iowa Physicians for Social Responsibility and the Great March for Climate Action for helping to sponsor the program. And for Gateway Market, one of our business partners for sponsoring this segment of our show. Uh, speaking of food, we are going to talk about Iowa's food banks. There has been much controversy about the food banks this legislative session because there are those, like me, who feel they ought to be funded. And there are those, like State Senator Mark Shelgren, who disagree. And we always try to have a respectful, civil dialogue about the differences of opinions on issues like this on this program. And I believe uh, Mark Shelgren was going to join us in the studio, but given the... Uh, the craziness of the tail end of session, which I think we are in. He's going to be joining us on the phone instead. Mandy, do we have Mark with us? Mark, welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Ed. Where are you calling us from? Uh, actually, I'm in the Senate lounge right now. I just voted on a, uh, a personal civil liberties bill that uh, uh, I was concerned about uh, taking DNA from, uh, from individuals. Really? I'd love to hear more about that. That could be an issue we might be on the same page on. I don't know. I'd have to hear more. But food banks, we disagree. I mean, my feeling is it's an important service. Let's fund it. What's your thoughts? <laughs> you know, I think that's kind of funny because uh, I've had two opportunities to vote on that, and I actually have voted both times in agreement with you, so I'm not quite sure why you, oh. voted. you brought me on to disagree. Oh, well, I, okay. I, I'm so, I apologize. I both times I voted for it. I apologize. Then I I had her, I, I No. I, Okay. I, now, I, I will tell you that uh, I am supportive of predominantly tax credits for food banks because I'd like to see uh, the food banks supported by private charitable donations. Uh, and so my feeling is I think that uh, the government should not be replacing charities, uh, but I do believe that there are certain specific issues that the government should be involved in. And I think food banks rises to that level of merit, especially in times when we have uh, the financial resources to invest uh, in types of things like that. So okay, no, but actually, now if my memory serves correctly, and that's always a good question, the um, <laughs> the the vote was a twofold issue. There was there was a discussion about tax credits, and I right. think most lawmakers, Republican and Democrats, supported tax credits, meaning that if you donated to the food bank, you could qualify for a tax credit in your that's next correct. filing. But well, the 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 real difference of opinion was over an appropriation to support the food banks, a direct appropriation from state government. I think it was half a million. I think it was 500,000. I believe that's right. And I think I was one of the only Republicans to support that appropriation. Oh, so you voted for that one as well. I did. So what's <laughs> wrong with the rest of your caucus? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I go back there and I try to tell them, try to tell them, and they just don't listen some days. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, I, I don't, I really, I don't get it. I, I it, it's, it's remarkable to me that, uh, that you can make arguments in favor of a, a an eighteen million dollar appropriation to Facebook, you know that's that's state money as well, and yet you can't you somehow can't find your way to five hundred thousand dollars to support. And we're, I mean, we're talking about food banks all over Iowa across the state, and maybe I mean you're from one of the more, you know, the more the poorer parts of uh, rural Iowa. Absolutely. I mean, maybe what? maybe and maybe that helps affect your viewpoint on this. You know, I, the, the whole thing about it is, you know, I tell people all the time, I, I, first of all, I was the first Republican elected in that area in like 26 years, okay, if, like for any office. Right. But, I'm, but I don't consider myself to be a very good Republican. I am a constitutional libertarian. I believe in civil liberties. I believe in individual uh, responsibilities. Um, I believe that we try to follow the Constitution um, you know, to the uh, – that's our oath. I mean, we, when you give an oath, you keep your word. Okay. Um, you know, but there's a difference. I also do believe – that there is a social responsibility that we have um, as communities that we look after those things. Now, in times when we have, uh, you know, very little money or, or we've been irresponsible with our spending, um, you know, obviously we've got to make harder decisions on how we spend the money. But in times when we've done a good job of budgeting, at times times when we've done a good job, we have we have money that's available to us. Uh, we need to look at how we're going to most benefit the people of Iowa and return that money back to them in any way we can. Yeah. So what what is what is this what is the story with uh, other folks in your caucus who can't seem to stomach any appropriation for the food banks? Uh, what don't they get? Well, I mean, obviously, when you try to speak for somebody else, you, I'm making some 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 of the guesses, but you know, some of the things I've heard. Uh, mostly, what I've heard is that um, well, people don't want to have government supplant private charities. Um, you know, the example is, you know, there's a guy who says, oh, so I, I take a truckload of melons and other things that we've grown, and I deliver it directly every time, um, you know, and I, and I get my tax credit for that. Um, you know, and, and, he, and he feels good about doing that. He says, you know, if I were mandated to do that, uh, I wouldn't 
it, it wouldn't be charity. It would suddenly be uh, an additional tax for that purpose. Um, so I don't know. I mean, you know, like I said, food banks to me are, are a great asset to the state. Um, I think, you know, at least in my community, they help out a lot. Um, so I really, you know, like I said, I voted for it because I couldn't have that. I didn't have that many arguments against it. <laughs> okay. So, so what, what of that argument, though, that we shouldn't be funding a private charity uh-huh. And, and, and I stack that up next to the legislature's, and particularly Governor Branstead's, uh, incredible um, largesse when it comes to individual businesses. Private sure. businesses get money. Private charities oh. don't. Hey, I, I, I agree. First of all, I agree with you completely. They shouldn't get money. Um, this was a discussion, and one of the problems I had with Senator Volcom, and I know he's probably relatively frequent. You talk to him on a lot of basis. Um, I don't I actually, you know, to be honest with you, Mark, I can't get, I can't get Senator Volcom to return a phone call. Oh, that's too bad. Well, yeah, well, I think um, so, too. Uh, so, I, again, I want to say I really appreciate the fact that you are willing to come on this program and talk with me. No problem. I mean, and I'll, and I'll tell you, you know, where I stand with it. Um, I don't believe we should be investing in any business, any company, any corporation, no matter what. I don't believe any company should pay a negative tax. We should not be giving tax credits to anybody to incentivize them, them to be here. You know, but I will give Debbie Durham at, at the Department of Economic Development credit for standing up to senators and saying directly, if we had a more clean – fairer tax code in the state of Iowa, we wouldn't have to be offering these exorbitant um, packages of tax credits and giveaways of taxpayer money to these companies to come here. Now, I have businesses here in Iowa. I haven't asked for anything, but when I watch tax dollars being given to a company coming into the state of Iowa, I'm like, well, what about the companies who are here because they want to be in Iowa, and you don't have to bribe them to be here? Uh, well, you know, I, and, I, <clears throat> and I agree with you 100% on that. I uh... And I don't know where it ends. I mean, we keep we keep upping the ante. We keep raising more and more. Uh, you know, the, the the bar keeps going up in terms of how much we're willing to dole out to corporations. And of course, one down in your part of the state, if you if you factor in local and state tax incentives of various types, tax incentives and credits, two hundred and fifty one million bucks to one fertilizer plant. Right, yeah. and that's um that's actually yeah that's 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 uh, southeast of me that's that's coming there. Yeah, I I, I agree completely. I mean, it's one of those things where. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we are not bribing companies to be here. Because what happens on the day when we actually get our act together and work together and say, okay, we're going to get rid of the exemptions, we're going to get rid of the giveaways, and we're going to lower everybody's taxes so that we have a more even playing field? Right. Well, are these companies simply going to say, well, we were only here for the, for the, for the freebies, and they're right. going to leave? Right. You know, I want people here because they love the state and, and they want to work hard to improve it for everybody. Well, and that happens all the time. They come for the tax incentives, and, and if they get some juicier tax incentives somewhere else 10 years down the road, they're gone. So That's right. Hey, um, you know, uh, Mark, I've got uh, former state representative Bill Witt on the, uh, on the uh, line. He's, uh, he's been doing a lot of work uh, post-legislature, legislative career, uh, with food banks. Uh, sometimes we have a little trouble with two phone calls at once, but if you're okay, I, wouldn't, I would love to bring him on and maybe right. have him share his perspective and get your, your feedback on what he has to share. Would that be okay? Yeah, that'd be great. Let's see how it works, Maddie. Hello, Bill. I'm here, Ed. Are you there? Yes, and speak up because sometimes the connection doesn't work quite as well when we have two folks on the phone. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do my best here. I'm, you know, first I'm, I'm very pleased to hear Senator Shelgren talk this way. Uh, as you indicated, I've been volunteering for the Northeast Iowa Food Bank now for several years. Uh, I drive a delivery truck for them on a 200-mile round-trip route up to Northeast Iowa. Mm. And uh, we pick up food, you know, uh, donated food at Walmarts. We deliver to food pantries. We also deliver uh, what are called backpacks to schools. Mm-hmm and churches, and others. Uh, and so, you know, I, I see this up close. There are over 65,000 Iowans just in northeast Iowa, many of them children, um, many elderly, uh, who don't have enough food. And uh, so, you know, I, I really have uh, come to uh, take some pride in this mm. and be grateful for this opportunity to help people. Uh, but it's, it mystifies me why, uh, you know, the governor and many Republicans say that we shouldn't be subsidizing private charities. Uh, and yet, we, as you've indicated, we subsidize all kinds of private businesses. Um, and I'm just wondering what kind of uh, arguments could be used to persuade these people that, um, you know, we, this is, if any, if any, uh, enterprise, any charitable enterprise ought to be 
uh, you know, viewed favorably by Republicans, this is it. You, I mean, there's a minimal investment of, of public dollars. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the Food Bank of Northeast Iowa has over 40,000 uh, total volunteer hours donated every year. Really? That's, uh, that's a, lot of, a lot of manpower and woman power. Right. Yeah. Uh, the appropriation would only buy food. Now, last year when the governor vetoed it, I understand that uh, he said, well, it's going to be used for infrastructure. No, not at all. Well, and, I mean, uh, it's only for food. And so I, I sort of expected that uh, once this was understood, that his objections would be withdrawn. Let me um, um, let me let me ask Mark. Uh, I, I, and I really again, I, I I'm not as close to the details as I as I as I was accustomed to being in the past. Mark, what is the uh, status of the legislation right now? Do we have any sense of what Governor Branstad is going to do on it? Yeah, I don't. I can't speak obviously for the governor. Sure. Um, I know that it passed out of the Senate. Um, uh, I don't know. I assume it passed to the House, but I don't know that either. I mean, uh, I must say I'm a little uh, tunnel vision at this point, being in the Senate. Uh, sure. Once the bill leaves here, I don't really continue to follow it. Um, you know, hopefully I get a notice every once in a while when the governor's going to sign something, but that's about the extent of, of what I find out about these bills. Um, so for me, I would assume it's going to continue the progress through the through the uh, the House and then to the governor's office. Uh, I know whether the governor will sign it or not. I have no idea about that. Um, you know, for me, it's one of those things where, uh, once again, whether it be a charity or whether it be a private indus- industry, um, any time that you sign up for taxpayer dollars, you also sign up for taxpayer strings. And, um, you know, I was recently working with um, Special Olympics, and, um, you know, the, basically the state of Iowa gives $100,000 to the Iowa Special Olympics. Well, that's out of um, a $3 million budget. Right. And so when you deal with such a small percentage of the overall budget, the question is, do you want strings attached with it for that much money? Right. Well, again, some of the strings that are attached to uh, to uh, grants from the Economic Development Authority are pretty loose. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, it, it depends. I mean, I know, I know that there are lawmakers that have tried to create greater levels of accountability for economic development assistance. And. And uh, there has been resistance to that. I mean, I like what you're saying. I think if the taxpayers are footing the bill on anything, there ought to be accountability. The trick, I think the trick is to create some accountability without bogging things down in bureaucracy. That's the challenge. Yeah, can I get back in on this here? Sure. Uh, because that was the other point I was, I was starting to make, and that is if you're about accountability and you're about return on investment, uh, it's well documented that every dollar donated or given to a food bank uh, returns at least ten dollars of value for that one dollar invested, mm. and in, in some cases uh, that that ratio goes from ten to one to twelve to one to sixteen to one, mm. uh, and it's well documented. The the books are very clear and accurate. So. Unlike a lot of these other things that we, quote, invest in with very loose rules attached and a a lot of difficulty to figure out just what we're getting back, it's very clear what we're getting back. Yeah. We are, we're right now, we are feeding over 270,000 Iowans at a cost that they themselves could never Never begin to to make. Um, a lot of the volunteers are, are church type people as well. I know a lot of churches get very involved with the food pantries, and we do yeah. too. I mean, when we deliver to Decora, we deliver uh, the what are called the backpack components to right. the, uh, the Methodist Church, and they have a large number of volunteers who greet us right on the spot. When we yeah. deliver our food to the uh, uh, First Lutheran Church pantry in Decora, again, yeah. Uh, they've got a big number of volunteers already. Well, Bill, I, I really appreciate, uh, you know, you, you, you remind me of Jimmy Carter. He retires from office and goes off to do great work for the community. So uh, <laughs> thank well, you for uh, what I'm, you're doing. I'm it mystifies me why Republicans aren't uh, embracing this. Yeah. I mean, this, if anything, should be right in line with what Republicans profess to be their values. Yeah. Well... <laughs> I let, actually agree with you. <laughs> let, let me put you back on hold, Bill, as I wrap up this segment so you can hear the rest of the conversation. I've got to go to a break soon. But, uh, yeah, Mark, um, what what can we do to get um, more interest in the Republican caucus? I mean, again, I, I, maybe I've, maybe that's a question I'm repeating, uh, repeating again. But um, I had assumed that you had voted with, uh, with the rest of the crowd. 
No. Um, so I, I apologize for that. That no, was that was bad bad information that I received and bad research on my part. But uh, well, hopefully next time what you can do is you can bring me in one and we can argue on something because I'd love to argue with you on something. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, that um, would be a lot of fun. But, uh, but, I, but I can tell you, you know, I'm I was one of the I think I might have been the only Republican who voted against um, the creation of IPEP, which was the Economic Development Authority. Um, and I voted against that also because I didn't believe that we should be creating special corporations um, in order to run these private par- or public-private partnerships for economic development. I didn't well, want us to be giving out right. special incentives to these companies. Well, but now um, would, would you agree, too, that uh, my, my, one of my biggest concerns about the Iowa Economic Development Authority is the fact that it operates behind closed doors? I mean, none of us knew about the Facebook uh, incentives until it was announced. We, right. didn't have a, we didn't have a chance to have input. There were no public hearings. Right. And, and maybe and let me ask you, did you know, as a state senator, did you know about the Facebook arrangement no. before it was no, announced? I, I actually learned about it on the radio. So, I mean, like, just like the general public, you know, you charged with, you know, dispensing the taxpayer's money appropriately. Even you weren't included. So, yeah, that was certainly the right vote. Now, how many people actually voted against establishing that authority? It passed pretty heavily on both the Republican and Democrat yeah. side. I figured um, it might be a Democratic problem as well as a Republican problem. So <laughs> that, I think that one is. I think, but I think the reason it passed that way, and I think the reason a lot of Democrats voted for it, was because it can very easily be put in the lap of the governor. Right. And I think the intent was, well, fine, if this is what you want, we'll give it to you. But you know, sometimes you don't always like what you get. Well, the truth is, Governor Branstad is not that different than Governor Vilsack when it comes to economic development. No, you know. actually, I, I would agree with that. And I, I had long talks with Governor Vilsack when he was governor about economic development issues when I was uh, starting my companies up. Um, and um, and I would say that, you know, that, that there's, there's desire, I think, with pretty much every governor. I'll give Colbert the same credit, which is, you know, they want to spur economic development. Uh, I do think Branstad does take it to another level with regards to how much time he mm. spends directly working with companies around the world to try to bring them here and to try to uh, maximize the amount of business aspects that, that Iowa has. I mean, he has a yeah. lot of experience doing that. I mean, yeah. I, I try to criticize Governor Branstad when he deserves it, and I try to give him credit when I think he deserves it. So, Yeah, and I do the same, and I'm mostly on the critical side. But uh, every once in a while, <laughs> he does get a pat on the back for me. Uh, Mark, I've, I've enjoyed talking with you, and um, I look forward to finding something we can disagree on so we can uh, we can have a real... Uh, uh, a real, real uh, go at it here in the studio someday. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you'll find plenty of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but I, again, I really appreciate your voting for the full appropriation for the food banks of Iowa and anything you can do to encourage the governor to support that. I mean, you know, he does sign, he does sign support for, he sign the bill that supports the, the, he approves of the money that goes to support the world food prize. And that's an even greater appropriation than this. Yep. And this is going directly to people in need. So. Well, I just voted against the bill for uh, DNA testing that he wanted, so I'm probably not on his real happy list right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being an independent thinker. I really appreciate it. No problem. All right, you, good, luck with, great day. good luck with the tail end of session. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, folks, uh, we're going to talk with Ron Yarnell when we come back. I do want to thank Gateway Marketing Cafe for sponsoring this segment of our show. They're at 20th and Woodland in the Sherman Hill neighborhood. Not just a fantastic grocery store, but a cafe as well for breakfast, lunch, and supper. So check them out, folks. That's Gateway Marketing Cafe at 20th and Woodland. I also want to thank uh, the Repertory Theater of Iowa for being one of the fantastic local theater companies we have here in Des Moines. And remind folks that there's still a whole week and left, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I think Sunday as well. uh, Four productions left for the uh, that championship season. And if you haven't seen it, it's a great production. It's probably one of the two best productions I've seen here in Des Moines. They did a great job, and it's worth uh, turning out to, uh, to show your support. And again, it won't just be a matter of support. This isn't charity. This is great provocative theater that will get you thinking not just about sports, but about politics, about money, about power in general. Anyway, it's a good good production. Check it out. Des Moines Social Club is where the performances occur at. You can go online to learn more at RepertoryTheaterOfIowa.com. I'll be back in just a few minutes again. Ron Yarnell is going to join us. We're going to talk about May Day and where, where that all came from. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. 
Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. June in the Lord's year 2010, and this is day uno one of webcast1live.com. We will begin with Max World Live with my special guest, Tom Coates, in just a minute. There's Tom. Wait. Howdy. And uh, we will be live for the very first time on webcast one live. this and say, gosh, remember that old day in history? Wonder where Walter Cronkite was. He must have been around hanging there too, but actually it's the beginning of Webcast One Live, and thank you for listening. Thanks, Rob Spearman and everybody who's put together this project together, and uh, we're ready to go live now. So thanks for listening to MaxWorldLive.com. I can't tell you that it's going real well from time to time, but it is going. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Welcome back, folks. That's Mr. Baber's Neighbors. I want to thank Tally's Restaurant for uh, sponsoring this segment of our show. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, State Senator Mark Shelgren for participating in the conversation on food banks. Uh, I, I do appreciate it. And again, I, um, I, I don't mind having people in here who disagree with me. I extend invitations to folks who I disagree with all the time. Sometimes they say yes. Brad Zahn is particularly good about that. Um, I don't get, you know, the, I, I got to say this. Republican lawmakers tend to be much better at saying yes to coming on this program than Democrats. Uh, there are some obviously, obviously uh, very notable exceptions, like uh, State Representative Dan Kelly, who's been a fantastic uh, and, re- and regular participant in this program, giving us, I think, some really good insights as to what's going on at the State House. Uh, Rob Hogue, as well, has been very uh, engaging. Um, but, you know, there are folks, again, that just don't seem to have any interest in, uh, in dialoguing. They don't even want to return a phone call, answer an email. I don't get that. You know, when I can get a response immediately from Senator Harkin's office the same day, uh, when I can get a phone call back or an email back from the Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, and again, Vilsack and I disagree on so many things. I respect that a lot. That goes a long way with me. When I can't even get a return call or an answer to multiple emails from Senator Bolcom, Senator Yoakum, uh, you know, I mean, and, and folks, you know, I mean, Come on, you have an obligation to dialogue with the public about issues that we care about. Um, this isn't just because I'm a talk show host. You should be willing to respond to any and all 
for phone calls, emails. Yeah. Again, I, I don't I don't get that. I didn't do that when I was in the House. And I'm glad to know there are folks like Senator Shelgren who don't do that, who do take the time to dialogue. Anyway, um, speaking of Rob Hogue, here's one senator who's also become an author. He uh, just uh, released a book on climate change. It's called America's Climate Century. He had a ceremony Monday at the State House announcing this book, giving away a bunch of free copies and signing them. You can get them here in Des Moines at uh, Beaverdale Books. And they're also available in uh, Iowa City at Prairie Lights and in New Bow Books in Cedar Rapids. Uh, again, Rob Hogue is doing um, incredible work on the climate change issue, and I'm honored to ha have him in the State House here and honored to have him on this program fairly regularly. Speaking of honored to have on the program fairly regularly, it's Ron Yarnell in the studio with me. Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ed. How are you doing? Happy May Day. Thank you very much. Yeah. So you're here specifically because it's May Day. And because yeah, you're yeah, I want to talk a little bit about May Day because I think it's an interesting um, um, holiday. Um, uh, I mean, people think of May Day and something, oh, communism. Well, uh, May, Day, May Day uh, dates pagans. back as a uh, European folk holiday, dates back in European folk culture. Uh, but May Day is, uh, in its modern sense, as uh, the International Labor Day, uh, is actually an American product. It, 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 it's an American creation. Uh, 1886. Um, is that recent? Yeah, that recent. Really? 1886, as a, as, a labor, as a labor holiday. In 1886, uh, there was a movement in this country uh, for the eight-hour workday, and uh, there was an incident in Chicago at, uh, at sure. Haymarket Square yes. where many people gathered and- Were um, killed. And a bomb was thrown. No one knows to this day who threw the bomb. The police opened fire on the crowd, killing lots of people. They even killed, in the process, some of their own fellow police in the crossfire. Mm. Uh, except there was no crossfire in the sense that anyone shot back. From what we can be able to determine, uh, the p police were the only ones who were shooting. Um, as as a result, uh, it became a, kind of a Martyrs' Day, yeah, and um, had a great deal of, of of emotion attached to it. Now, at that time, the uh, traditional um, or, or uh, American labor establishment, as as actually relatively new as that was, they were pushing for a labor holiday, a Labor Day. Right. Uh, they wanted it in September. An interesting thing happened the next year. 1887, President Grover Cleveland, he didn't want to give too much focus on the Haymarket incident. So he signed into law the Labor Day that we know today, the Labor Day that comes in September, mm. as a way of dis uh, distracting people from from what, what was occurring. However, Labor Day, uh, May Day as a labor holiday took on a life of its own. It, it grew to international proportions. Uh, there are, in most of the world, May first is Labor Day. It's the day where working yeah. people uh, celebrate. So, so, so we started it, but it's still not celebrated here on May Day. But very it is int elsewhere in the world. Very intentionally, it's very yeah, but that, intentionally. But that's very that's interesting. In, in fact, conservative uh, lawmakers and, and leaders <clears throat> have tried various ways of kind of suppressing the 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 meaning of May Day. For example. By law, it's known as Loyalty Day. The last person to announce it to be Loyalty Day is George W. Bush, uh, where the em emphasis— Loyalty was, to what? Well, to, <laughs> to whoever tells you what to do. Okay, well. Uh, to, to, to your, to your uh, lawfully received authorities. Uh, to, I've, ne I've never heard of that one, Ron, Loyalty to, Day. Well, no one has because it, it, it didn't have any legs. It, it's just something that uh, Republican conservative lawmakers, uh, Republican presidents issue when they're in office, but it never goes anywhere because, I, I mean, what would be the point? Yeah. It, it really has no point to it. But it is kind of a way of trying to obscure the— uh, the uh, radical uh, workers' rights nature of May Day. I kind of was thinking how in 1886 they were fighting for the eight-hour workday. And I'm thinking maybe we have to have that fight again because it looks to me like many people 
the eight-hour workday looks good to them because they don't, yeah, they don't it's, really it's, enjoy it. It's kind it. of a thing of the past. I right. mean, in, cert in certain sectors, you can still expect to work eight hours a and, day. But. And the other thing, with Labor Day being in September, uh, you know, Ed, you're a fairly uh, well-versed person. You keep on touch with current affairs. When was the last time you heard a significant labor leader give an impassioned, spine-chilling oratory on Labor Day? Oh, I've heard that. Well, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. What, what are you referring to? Well, when was the last time a, uh, a significant labor leader stood up? When you and, say significant labor leader, you mean nationally? Or? AFL CIO president. I, yeah, I've heard, I've heard plenty of good speeches from local labor leaders uh, on Labor Day okay, and elsewhere. Okay, how about on the national scene? Um, didn't follow that as much when I was at the <laughs> state house. I was more interested in the uh, okay. the state level legislation. Uh, it used to be that uh, Labor Day, even in the September Labor Day, used to be a day when labor uh, would would stand up and be counted. It would be a day when uh, leaders, uh, labor leaders, would uh, give their best oratory. And now, that doesn't even have. And what, what's what, what's September Labor Day today? It's it's not even a day that even really has anything to do with labor it has to do with sales it has to do with the fact that you well should... it has to do with taking the day off and relaxing from one's labor respecting those who've worked so you give them a day off we have how, a night, how we often have a... does that happen anymore <clears throat> well, on labor day it, it usually does happen and we have a, a huge parade the labor day parade is pretty good here, i i i i w do the big stores in town shut down? I, I'm not sure about that because i never go to the big stores okay <laughs> do even the little stores in town shut down you know, I, I some of them might. I can't remember. Okay, I, I, you, I, I, again, I'm not, I'm not the best person to ask there when it comes to go. questions about shopping. May, 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 maybe uh, because it has a, a federal, um, it's a federal holiday. Maybe uh, well, there's no mail. Civil, for sure. okay. So, so uh, public employees get the day off, but in terms of private, uh, private workers, private employees, Labor Day. I mean, if you can get it off, fine. But really, well, yeah, but, but you know, mean, day. Now, my but my yeah, point yeah. is that uh, Labor Day. Um, we, we, we can get the sense of where labor is at in this country by how Labor Day in September really doesn't have much. I get your point. Yes. Significance. Yeah. Um, but May Day, the May, May 1st, um, I think in many ways, maybe it's a good thing that uh, it hasn't gotten federal approval because, you know, what? It, it, once something becomes a holiday, then they automatically figure out how to kind of defang it, how to, well, take how to it. commercialize it for right. one thing. And I, I mean, think, look at Martin Luther King day. It used to be, a, 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 right. it used to be a, his right. life was about justice. The holiday is about right. service, which is, I mean, service is fine, but it's not the same as justice. And now, and now you can get good sales on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Well, okay. There's that too. You I, know? I, I think to me, what labor day is about though, it's a, a day, uh, May Day is a day to remember the story of labor, which is a very obscured, almost uh, suppressed story in this country, a story of struggle, a story of, of violent repression. Uh, I remember some years ago, a few years ago, uh, when someone on the right was you know, talking about how he can't imagine, for example, the U.S. Army uh, or federal authorities uh, violently opposing uh, the American citizens. Well, if you know anything about the labor movement, you know that happened that, a whole, whole bunch history. of times. Sure, yeah. It, it, it's been a violent, uh, unhappy history. And it reminds me also that nothing that you and I have at, when, we're, when we're working for people, not a decent uh, work schedule, not, not our coffee break, not our bathroom break, nothing came to us without struggle and hardship. Yeah. You know, and, and I, you know, we, it used to be... Um, I mean, it, it, it used to be a much larger percentage of the working population that belonged to labor unions. It's yeah. down quite a bit. Well, and we there are more and more people who are saying, well, is labor even needed anymore? Well, I mean, we, you, we, you get we, that all we the talked time. about that. Labor unions have been so defanged, practically outlawed all but in form by the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947. We already talked about that. Right. Uh, labor unions are dinosaurs, uh, the, the, the establishment labor movement, I mean, God bless them, but they really don't have any oomph in, in, in the economy anymore. Well, and, and is, that, is that just an issue of numbers? That, that's an issue of law. They, the, everything well, that labor unions need to be successful has been outlawed. Right. You can, you, you know, you now corporations can now hire strike breakers as we discovered at Firestone back in the nineties when there was a, a big, and, a big and strike also, there and a Titan tire as and well. And also the reality is that we live in a globalized economy and 
uh, communication and transportation is much cheaper. You know that you have a, a you have a son in, in the business, right? He's a, he's a he's a he's a union member, uh, but he's also a merchant seaman, so he knows. Right. You know, he, he lives off of globalization, and, and that's nothing wrong. Well, with that's that. true. Yeah, the, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong. But the sense is that you know, um, the the world has been organized into a colossal factory. And basically the system. Yeah, and, and in Bangladesh, those factories are collapsing on 2,000 right. workers, killing 350 of this, this most and, recent. And basically stage. the way the system works, it always has to, it has to seek out the cheapest and most docile labor. That, that's a necessity. Of, you know, and eventually that chicken is going to come home and roost right here in the U.S. As, as other will. countries become, as, as there, there are struggles to gain mm -hmm. rights and protections for workers, as factory conditions improve, as environmental conditions mm -hmm. improve. And as we let these things slide in this country, we're going to be the next cheap labor market, you know, what, 10, 15, 20, well, 30 years from now. We, we already are. Uh, well, maybe. The, the American worker has the worst deal in the developed world, bottom line. The American worker hasn't seen uh, an uplift since the 1970s. Uh, we work harder and we get less. And that's kind of just the bottom line there. And... I, I can't give you any solution because because the situation I, I, I and you can feel it the despair and the hardship and the, just the feeling of uh. well, I I know I know who has you know you, you we want answers we want empathy yeah. the strongest defender of labor I know is is Frank from Des Moines that's right yeah. Frank, welcome to the show. Well, welcome to all you Elvis fans. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something to be said for uh, Des Moines' cultural and culinary status when you know you've got Elvis's love child right here in the, well, city's, in the, in the uh, state's capital. If that was only true, I may have I may have some rights to some estate. So uh, anyway, are you, are you're, 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 I'm being sarcastic, of course. Everyone knows that you're not the strongest defender of organized well, labor that ever you know, walked the planet. Maybe the opposite, in fact. Well, let me ask Ron. Uh, Ron, you, you believe in God. You're a faith-oriented person, correct? Yep. Okay. Now you know the you know the original story of the fall of Adam and Eve. I assume. Uh, yep. Part part of the uh, the 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 uh, punishment that was issued out or discipline that was issued out by by Christ was that uh, uh, Eve would start bearing children in in pain. And her uh, her affections would be towards her husband, and part of Adam's uh, uh, punishment or, or discipline was that he would work by the sweat of his brow, and thorns and thistles he'd grow his whole life. Now, why are we celebrating labor? What point is there to celebrating labor? Do you like who you are, Frank? Yeah, you know, I, I'm proud to be an American. I'm are, you, are you proud to be a working person? Are you proud to be a person of labor? But but. When, when, when God says right off the bat that Frank, I'm going to grow thorns and thistles all my life and I'm going to work by the sweat of my brow, right off the bat he tells me that my, my efforts are going to be in, in vain and most likely are going to be underappreciated and, and uh, probably underrewarded. Frank, usually you wait a little while before you bring your Bible into it. Uh, you just jump right to it there. Well, yes, so let me, but, let me, let me, let me we, let's, let's put Scripture behind us for a second. Okay. Da, do you think it's good that people have to work so hard and struggle so hard? I mean, so so under such horrible conditions that their their lives are shortened, that their their well their well being is is challenged. That they, in some cases, I mean, when I when I was on when I went to the picket line at Firestone back in '94 and stood with those workers on 30 different occasions on the picket line, the stories I heard, the visual impressions that were left with me, and people who had lost fingers, arms. Um, who told me stories about getting burned, uh, about sweating profusely in a hundred plus okay, degree heat? Uh, I mean, come in, th that's not good, Frank. Fr that's not very Christian, Fr Frank. Frank, I want to ask you a question okay. for a change. Explain to me why traditionally Christian countries have the best working conditions in the world. Well, because Christians generally look out for their brother. And it's not all about self in the Christian environment, and, and you're continually looking out for your brother's welfare. Okay, now, thank you. Um, I'll go with that for a second. Are you familiar with Ayn Rand? I've heard the name. I'm not Ayn Rand is the animating figure right now in the conservative movement. 
Okay. Okay. Paul Ryan made his staff read Ayn Rand's novels. All right. Ayn Rand's basic argument is that selfishness is the greatest virtue. But are you going to legislate selfishness and immorality out of man? Is that even possible? No, but you can you can put some 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 uh, restrictions on what you're allowed to get away See, with. Christ, when he came to this earth, he okay. Did... Let's 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 talk about let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about Bible. Do we have to? Well, just briefly, because <laughs> that that the Bible is the basis for the respect and honor that are accorded to workers. Before the Bible, the world had no concept of a Sabbath, none whatsoever. The Roman Empire during the time of Jesus had no concept of a Sabbath. It was seven days of work. You worked until you dropped exhausted. How is that possible when the, when the Sabbath was created, you know, God created, or Jesus created, Christ created the world in six days, and he rested from his labors on the Sabbath. Okay, other, other than the ancient Israelites and the Jews, who else in the world, to your knowledge, observed the Sabbath? Okay, now just hold on, though. But when, Christ, when the fourth okay, commandment... Okay, you, know you know folks, I, I'm, I'm not, this is oh, not going to okay. become a religious conversation, okay? Yeah. There, there are Frank, 15 Frank, other this, shows in this. Frank, this is my politics point, and about Frank, issues. this is my basic question <laughs> for you. Why do you always stick up for the high and the mighty? Why don't you ever stick up for the underdog? Because they play by their own rules, and there's no way to force them to play by our rules. Because who they says take, who? They the can take says their who? money. They can take their money and bury it in the backyard. Who gives them? Who play. gives them their money, Frank? You do. It's your money. You produce it for them. Without you, the rich have nothing. Well, have you ever known a time in the world where there wasn't slave labor somewhere in the world? Are you arguing in favor of slave labor? No, but I'm Are you saying, saying that's an no, inevitability, no, no. that we should consign ourselves to slave I'm labor? Saying, but this is the reality. The rich always dominate things. The, 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 the hierarchy always dominates so things. So you're in favor of the hierarchy. You're in favor of the rich. You, well, believe, gonna... you believe that might makes right, right, and the rest of us are just like it or right. lump it. But is that always... your argument? Because I'm going to have to tell you, Frank, that's not what the Bible teaches no it doesn't but you never you never solve these problems by coercion you always solve them says through, who through through love S says who are you advocating a marx lenin attitude no i'm uh, i'm advocating a martin luther king jr attitude and martin luther king jr coerced people well all i know is the difference between marx and lenin is one was willing to be a little bit more patient and the other wanted to go more into open revolution now are you calling for the patience or are you calling for the more open frank i'm talking for i'm i'm calling for justice and fairness i'm calling for guys like you to respect yourself to honor yourself to not see yourselves as people who just have to roll over for every rich guy who tells you how high to jump and i'm calling for a very very delayed break I got to go, Frank. Uh, I apologize for having to interrupt a very intriguing conversation at moments, but I appreciate you calling. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elvis. All right. <laughs> uh, when we get back, I do got a little more ground we got to cover today. This is a good conversation, and uh, I'll give you a minute to wrap up, uh, Ron, but I do got to run to a break. Um, I do want to thank, uh, I, I want to thank um, all of our sponsors. I'll make a specific plug for one. When I come back, Maddie, we'll be back in a minute. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. The 8th Annual Natural Living Expo is May 18th and 19th at the 4-H Building at the Iowa State Fairgrounds. The Natural Living Expo is the place to learn about sustainable practices and healthy lifestyle choices. The Expo offers classes and vendors where you'll learn about green building design, sustainable agriculture, urban farming, non-toxic cleaning products, massage, and more. There's no cost to attend, and what you'll come away with is priceless. For more information, visit www.naturallivingexpo.org. That's www.naturallivingexpo.org. Community CPA is the 15th largest CPA firm in Iowa, providing audit, tax, and accounting services. Community CPA specializes in international tax treaty and double taxation avoidance among countries and states. Nine dedicated, experienced, hardworking staff are the company's foundation, and their compassion towards every client is the secret behind Community CPA's success. At Community CPA, you can expect quality service year round call 288-3188 community cpa 3816 ingersoll experience the difference
difference. Located in the heart of Beaverdale, Tally's offers speedy and affordable rooftop lunch, catering for events both large and small, innovative cuisine, as well as vegetarian and gluten-free menus. Come to Tally's for live music, dry-aged steaks, Sunday brunch, and all-you-can-eat ribs every Monday night. Tally's Restaurant Bar and Catering at 2712 Beaver Avenue. Call 279-2067. That's 279-2067. Times are tough, and most people are just trying to make their cars last a little bit longer. That's why you should know about Sargent's Garage in Des Moines. You can trust Sargent's to make the right diagnosis and give you a fair price. Whether it's a routine oil change or a major repair, Sargent's always does outstanding work. So don't give up on that old car just yet. Call Sargent's Garage at 246-8149. That's 246-8149 for Sargent's Garage. Nestled in the heart of downtown, Ritual Cafe is one of Des Moines' most unique places, offering a wide variety of coffee and tea. Ritual Cafe also serves the only all-vegetarian menu in town. And Ritual Cafe is a cultural hub for artists and musicians, with a performance stage hosting local, national, and international talent. Make Ritual Cafe a part of your daily ritual. On 13th Street between Locust and Grand in downtown Des Moines. And check out ritualcafe.com. Wow, some wedding. Yeah, I've never seen a bride in coveralls. Right, and skipping down the aisle to accordion music. Not to mention the reception. That wedding cake was a freaking fruit cake. It's your wedding. Don't leave anything to chance. Diana's Wedding Cakes. Using only the finest, freshest ingredients with free on-time delivery and setup. Choose one of Diana's custom designs or create your own. Call Diana's Wedding Cakes, 641-275-9279. That's 641-275-9279. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. That's Max Wellman, folks. I want to thank uh, Tally's Restaurant for uh, sponsoring the last segment of the show. Um, <clears throat> Tally's is at uh, 2712 Beaver Ave in the Beaverdale neighborhood. And again... Great indoor seating, of course, but this time of the year, my favorite place because you've got two outdoor options, one right there in the street and one up on the rooftop overlooking the scenic Beaverdale downtown. So check them out, folks. That's Tally's at 2712 Beaver Ave. I also want to thank Hawk Restaurant, one of our other restaurant uh, business partners. Hawk is at East 5th and Walnut. I'm having lunch there today. Hawk Restaurant is uh, unique because 90% of the food they serve comes from Iowa Farms. And with uh, the uh, growing season just upon us, I think the uh, the in the what they can do with the availability is going to be out of this world. Anyway, check them out, folks. That's Hawk Restaurant at East Fifth and Walnut Street. I also want to thank the uh, Natural Living Expo for their support of this program and remind folks that the Natural Living Expo is coming up on May 18th and 19th at the 4-H Building on the Iowa State Fairground campus. And I want to go briefly back to our conversation with Ron Yarnell about May Day. But before we finish this show, we're going to switch gears and talk Guantanamo Bay. But, but Ron, again, I appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. Well, I get frustrated every time we, anytime we get into religious arguments because, I mean, I'm a religion major. That was my focus in college. And yet, I don't think you need to talk about, you don't need to bring your faith into something that is a well, policy focus. Well, Ed, this is what I would say. And this is my interest in May Day. I think it's important that people should know uh, their history. I think it's important for people to know the history of struggle and hardship and uh, confrontation uh, that working people have had in this country. Otherwise, they really have no idea what's going on. And May Day is as American as apple pie in, in that regard. Um, I understand the reluctance about religion, but, you know, I, I hate to disagree with Frank, but the Bible is the chief instigator of positive change in the world. It tells people the world can be a better place than it is now. It, it does more than any other authoritative work to do that. Well, and you, you hate disagreeing with Frank. See, I feel, I, feel, I feel uneasy when I agree with Frank. Well, I'm, that, I'm, I'm just saying. I, that, I'm thinking maybe I'm I should re-examine my you, position. If you, don't want, if you don't want poor people to confront rich people, take the Bible away from them because Forget yeah. about Marx and Lenin. Marx and Lenin stole everything that they knew about class structure. They stole it all from the biblical narrative. And, and maybe some other time we can go through well, that. And, and, we, we, we can talk about Hegel yeah. and the Hegelian dialectic. Well, maybe we can talk about liberation theology. Well, that, that, 
that came later. But yeah, the bottom sure. line is that uh, today people, I think, are struggling with, with what to do and how to do things. And one of the reasons they're struggling is they don't know the story uh, uh, of their country. They don't know the story of, of average people in this country. And contrary, again, to Frank, things actually have gotten better. Um, if I ever invent a time machine, I will take any volunteer who wants to go from today back to 1886 and live there for a while and see how they like see how they like working a job in 1886. Yeah, I mean, things have gotten better. And depending on what constituency we're talking about, uh, it, it was quite a few decades after 1886 that women finally yeah. got the right to vote. And it was just uh, this last week that the first you know, openly gay, first gay person openly announced their identity, their, their, their sexuality, uh, and an NBA player. I mean, that's, uh, that's huge. So yeah, things do get better over time mm -hmm. in some cases in terms of, you know, yeah. society's rules and, and, uh, and, and growth as a yeah. community, but in some cases in terms and, of and labor. And we don't have to lay over and just roll into a fetal position just because people of wealth and power tell us to. Yeah, right. I would advise against that. So again, yeah, this is an important day for that. And uh, I hope people do take some time to remember the original reasons why May Day was uh, established. Um, but let's talk about another concern, Ron. I know you've got a, lo a lot of opinions about, uh, about Guantanamo Bay as well. I'm still... Again, Obama, Obama said he would close it. Um, he didn't. Some, including himself, blamed Congress for, you know, him. They, they, Congress uh, blocked him from doing that. I still have questions as to whether or not uh, he could have done it anyhow. But right now, the whole well, situation is in, is, in, 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 is in a greater focus because of the 100 prisoners at Guantanamo who have been on a hunger strike. And now some are being force-fed by the Department of Defense, a practice that President Obama is defending. Ed, uh, you come from an Irish background. Back in 1980, 1979, when the IRA went on hunger strike and uh, Northern Bobby Sands. Uh, um, how well did that go over in the Irish-American community? Um, did you hear anything about it? I was actually in Ireland at the time, and uh, it was a pretty big event there, obviously. Yeah. And Bobby Sands and some of the other prisoners died right. of their hunger strike. And this is not to show any sympathy for the IRA or their methods, but just to say it's interesting how I know in the United States, the Irish-American community, which I actually hold a, a membership card in, was outraged, outraged at the British for perpetuating the situation that led to the hunger strike. Um, they, they, they weren't they weren't outraged at the British for for letting them die. I think they were outraged that the circumstances were so bad that prisoners felt inclined to have to well that engage the situation in a hunger strike. Existed. Now I got no sympathy with Al Qaeda or the Taliban, but what does it mean when you keep you operate what basically constitutes a concentration camp? And for for folks who have not even been tried or, or not found been guilty. tried, have not been convicted. And then you basically tell them they're going to be in that camp for the rest of their lives, that their release is indefinite. What do you expect them to do? I think it would be, I'm not advocating this, but it would be more, it would be nicer if you just took them out, you, can, you, had, you court martial them and you shot them. Because right now what you're doing, what our country is doing is slow torture. Uh, it's phenomenal what uh, what, our, what our government has done in our name uh, to our enemies. And people will justify it. They'll say they deserve it. Well, you know, did we do this to the Nazis during World War II? And I can speak to that because my other ethnic uh, identity comes uh, from Germany. I had relatives who were German in the German army in World War II. They were prisoners of war. They were accorded all the rights of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, they were treated as real human beings. And they were people who, when as part of their military duty, swore to fight for Adolf Hitler. So mm. they, they fought for the most, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, what, what's regarded the most evil cause of the 20th century. And they were treated humanely. Right. Okay. They were treated like you would treat, they were treated honorably. And what we do now, we just keep out of sight, out of mind. We keep it offshore except the fact the whole rest of the world knows what we're doing and what kind of reputation do you think the United States is getting? Because of our conduct in World War II with prisoners, the United States came out of that war with an excellent reputation. Yeah. Because of our conduct with the prisoners we have now, our enemies, not so much. Yeah. 
Well, uh, we could have a much longer conversation about that. We could also have a much longer conversation about what's happening in the Iowa Senate regarding a manure bill. This is a bill that Iowa CCI and other folks concerned about corporate hog confinements have opposed. It was, um, it, it, they were told, they claimed they were told that Mike Gronstall indicated that it would not be brought up for a vote. Apparently that may happen. And I will remind folks that um, Senate Democrats have been no friends of those concerned about corporate hog confinements. In fact, it was Senate Democrats under Leonard Boswell with Tom Vilsack and Burl Preed helping out that passed the original hog confinement bill back in 1995 that set the uh, stage for the unlevel playing field that has basically forced small producers out of the business. But we'll talk more about that sometime as well when we get somebody who's been on the front lines there on this program. I want to thank Ron for joining us. I actually want to thank Frank for calling in. I want to certainly thank Senator Mark Shelgren and former state representative Bill Witt for their input on the food bank issue. I want to thank my producer, Maddie Arrington, Webcast One Live, for providing this studio. I want to thank the Great March for Climate Action and all the folks who are pushing to make that a reality. I want to remind you to go to the uh, go to the internet and check out the Million Dollar Marathon. This is a race, race, a relay across the country to raise money and awareness for cancer. And uh, you can join that. Uh, they're still looking for folks to run some of the legs of the marathon. It'll start in the Pacific uh, Coast, uh, come through Iowa, and end on the uh, Atlantic Coast in June and July. Also, folks, remember the Natural Living Expo coming up on May 18th and 19th. I'll be back tomorrow. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I am the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee.